panelom financiranje političkih partija i izbornih kampanja. Sada je vrijeme da čujemo međunarodna iskustva. Nažalost, pošto već godinama nema napretka na ovom planu i neke preporuke će vjerovatno biti vrlo slične, pošto ono što nam je ranije rečeno nije implementirano. Na početku ćemo čuti Lizu Klein, nezavisnog međunarodnog konsultanta za izbore. Hvala što ste sa nama, izvolite. Je li sve u redu? I think there is translation missing. Lisa, I think you were called to talk first by the moderator. There is translation now because I did not hear and translated. Okay, well, okay, thank you very much. And um, well, I'm, I'm pleased to be with you from a surprisingly sunny uh, London this morning. Uh, and I want to thank Mons for including me in the important work that it's doing. Yuki, Magnus, and I are all going to be talking about third party election activity. I'm going to provide a bit of background, a bit of introduction. Yuki will talk about some of the emerging issues, and Magnus will illustrate how this area is regulated in various countries. So, to begin with, uh, and given that time is short, let's just jump in. First of all, I think we need to define what we mean by third party uh, campaigning. Um, and the definition that I would proffer is that the term refers to entities or individuals that do not present candidates or lists, um, but who engage financially in election campaigning. Um, I dislike the term third party, and I would like to lead uh, a movement to eliminate it from our discussion because it makes sense to talk about a party in power, to, make, to talk about an opposition party, to talk about non-parliamentarian parties, but a third party? These are not parties in the traditional sense. They don't they're not there to present candidates and to win elections. And so I would like to propose that we abandon that term and today that we will call them non-contestant campaigners. So what type of non-contestant campaigning are we targeting? There are really two types. Uh, these are either individuals or entities who feel strongly about um, a topic or feel strongly about wanting to support a campaign, a, a party, or a candidate. And they may want to spend money um, having talked to the party or the candidate um, to do it in coordination or in agreement um, with them. Now, those are not independent expenditures, and I think we should put them to one side because very often in domestic law, these type of donations that are made in coordination with candidates and parties are going to be viewed as in-kind contributions. And so they usually are regulated elsewhere. But where an entity or an individual, a non-contestant uh, campaigner engages in activity independently, right? Um, I, I take, for example, um, um, organizations or entities that are very interested in the regulation of abortion rights, about environmental rights, about regulation of churches, as in the case of Montenegro, and they do it totally independently, there, that is really the focus of what we're talking about. They're doing it without the knowledge often, and certainly without the agreement of the parties. Why do we need to be concerned about this non-contestant campaigning? Well, there are three reasons. The first is that it's very easy. They can be used to circumvent the regulations that are in place. Because if you are regulating the political parties and the candidates, but this is an area that's not subject to regulation, then the source of funds used, for example, do not have to be limited as they may be for the electoral contestants. The amount that they raise and the amount that they spend may not be regulated. And it also diminishes, in some cases, I know in the United States, there's actually more money spent by the independent groups than by the political parties and candidates. And so you're really distorting the voice of the electoral uh, contestants. And finally, um, just to emphasize this again, this goes back to what is not the circumvention, is if it's not regulated, there's not going to be any transparency over it. 
So the options that we have in terms of regulation is are threefold. One is to do nothing. Uh, we can put our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist, although I think it's an increasing issue. And I think Yuki and Magnus will talk more about that. We could try to totally ban it. No third party can say anything or campaign. This would be very hard to reconcile when I think uh, uh, with international standards, possibly something that will come up later, but we have to remember that they're the fundamental freedoms of expression and of association. And this would seem to cut very much against that. Or we can adopt regulations that address third parties. If we do the latter, which is adopting regulations, then there are certain factors we need to consider. Um, if we start with the detailed questions, I guess we'd say who should be able to be a non-contestant uh, campaigner? Should foreigners be allowed or do they have to be eligible to vote in an election or eligible to donate money in terms of the domestic election? What type of activity will be covered? Will it just be communications and advertisements? That was certainly the law in the UK until 2014. Um, but you know, you could have a rally, you could hire the largest stadium in the country and uh, have a um, uh, uh, hire musical bands to perform and have a whole campaign rally at great expense. So you have to be thinking about what is going to be covered. The second thing, the third thing would be how is the non campaigning, uh, non contestant campaigning activity going to be defined? Now, there are variations here. Perhaps Magnus will talk about them. I don't know. You could go from the USA, which is very, very, very limited, saying basically it has to expressly advocate the election or defeat of a candidate or a party. So vote for or defeat. Well, that's easy to circumvent. You can have other countries where it may be with the intent to influence an election, which is softer. So there's, or you could conceivably have um, a limit or regulation, any um, um, uh, expenditure of this nature that is made during a particular time period. Um, so the next thing is what type of, should the um, third, these third parties or non-contestant campaigners be required to register if they spend any money or if they just spend above a certain threshold? And finally, what will be the reporting requirements? What will be the spending requirements? In addressing these questions, we must not forget that the overall goal, which could be summarized this, is to regulate this aspect of campaigning in a way that is proportionate, that allows scope for freedom of expression, and that minimizes the burdens on those wishing to engage in this activity while being effective and to ensure that whatever provisions are adopted can be properly implemented and enforced. And I will close there and hand it over to you, Yuki. Zahvaljujem gospođi Klein, sa nama je i doktor Yukihiko Hamada, rukovodilac programa Novac u politici, Međunarodni institut za demokratiju i izbornu pomoć ideja u Stockholm. Izvolite. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Lisa, for the very nice introduction on the issue. Um, once again, um, my name is Yuki Hamara, and thank you very, very much to the uh, men's and then organizers for having international idea again at the event um, at, organized by uh, MANS in Montenegro. It's certainly nice to be back and then see some familiar faces, even if this time it's virtual. Um, just to follow up with what Lisa has mentioned about so-called, um, well, third party campaigners or non-contested um, campaigners, um, I'm afraid I have to add uh, more programs to the table than, than, than solutions in my uh, short five minutes uh, or 10 minutes speech. Um, while, while this uh, third party campaigning or non-contestant campaigning issues has been around for quite a while, let's say in the last uh, 10 years or certainly in the last couple of years, and it's been heavily discussed, uh, the issue has become, unfortunately, become even more complicated um, in the in the last few years, and then certainly will be so uh, in the coming years, um, exactly because um, many aspects of political finance practices have become digital across the world. 
um, what what I mean by digitalization? Um, well, it, it's rather easy to imagine, but many political parties, for example, start raising funds through uh, crowdfunding, for example, and also candidates and political parties start using uh, social media platforms, uh, paid advertisements, um, targeted micro-targeted mechanisms to, to reach uh, more voters, for example. And, and then, of course, uh, voters themselves use uh, heavy rely on uh, Twitter, uh, WhatsApp groups, uh, or, or the other social media uh, platforms to gather information about political parties, uh, manifestos, and policies they're putting forward. But when it comes to um, transparency in, in, in the flow of money in this online campaign space, um, there's a significant lack uh, of transparency, and that there's a, almost no legal um, uh, framework to address these issues. Um, and potentially these uh, shortcomings are also um, easily exploited and abused by these uh, non-contestant groups. Um, for example, just to give you an example that um, um, many political parties are um, using paid advertisement on, on social media platforms right now. However, um, there's a very little uh, information available um, how much political parties and candidates are spending their resources on, on their online materials. And also it's not even very clear for, for anyone to understand who is actually paying for these online advertisements. So um, of course it may appear some advertisements are paid and promoted by the political parties themselves, but in reality, there might as well be a chance that um, neither political parties nor candidates. So in this case, um, some specific um, uh, non-contestant campaigners, uh, they could possibly also live abroad, uh, you know, outside Montenegro, for example, um, could be paying for some of those um, advertisement. And then in reality, in, in political finance regulation terms, these should be recorded as a either in-kind donations or, or some formal donations, for example, if it goes beyond certain threshold. But in the currently, uh, in, in the current legal settings, um, the, the term is not quite well defined and uh, a lot of the activities and spending uh, going unnoticed. So um, it's a common problem that we observe across countries. So it's not necessarily a Balkan specific, but it's, it's in Europe, Latin America, or even Asia. I mean, this problem we are seeing. And then there are some common challenges or common reasons why, why this is a very difficult area to um, regulate. And I just like to give you um, uh, examples um, to, for, for all of us to discuss today. Um, one major problem is, is to do with the um, speed of innovation versus uh, legislation process, legislative process, so to say. Um, as you can imagine, most uh, political finance laws and regulations in place um, are often drafted uh 10 years ago or even 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 older some of them in the more established democracies and of course all those laws and then regulations are subject to periodic review and then revision from time to time but um they are not necessarily um brought up to the speed or at least not first enough to catch up with this technological curve and they're certainly not ahead of uh, uh innovation so most countries as a result um currently fail to address or fail to define for example uh, what we mean by online campaigns or online advertisement. Um, as Lisa mentioned, if it's not actually defined by law, uh, whatever they do in that space, it's, 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 it's strictly speaking, it's not illegal. So um, the first step is definitely give it a, a legal ground and to, um, to establish a common understanding what we are trying to uh, regulate here. And then, of course, the, um, that leads to the another problem is that um, problem like third party campaigning or particularly online campaigns by the third parties. Um, in order to oversight, uh, provide a very effective oversight, a precondition is that, that, that a very close collaboration and cooperation from the private sector companies. But currently, um, as you could imagine, uh, especially those social media platforms do not necessarily uh, provide a required uh, information to uh, oversight national level oversight agencies um, on, on demand. They sometimes on case by case, they do provide and cooperate uh, uh, in some cases. However, it's not given universally 
and also some companies like Facebook, they, they have a digital library called Facebook ad, which uh, gives a comprehensive view of, you know, who's paying for what ad type of thing. But this level of transparency is not always given to other social media platforms either. So again, um, the, the level of cooperation and willingness uh, from the private sector side to work with the public sector to regulate this issue is, is somewhat limited, um, unfortunately. And then also when it comes to the um, actual the oversight of this um, spending on the online sphere, unfortunately, it's it's not it's not common uh, to to see that um, the public bodies that are responsible for oversight of political finance, be it um, electoral management body or anti-corruption body or national audit office. I mean, it doesn't matter which entity is given this responsibility, but they're not always equipped with um, necessary uh, human resources or technical resources to um, deal with this issue. Um, traditionally speaking, um, oversight bodies are often uh, staffed uh, with uh, people with legal background or um, accounting background or, or social science, political science type of um, background. But uh, to tackle this digital digitalization and then deal with the um, any upcoming uh, problems, we actually do need to invest on um, skill sets that are not traditionally part of the skill sets that um, uh, EMB HL policies often focusing on. So people with um, um, a more sort of IT savvy background is definitely uh, needs to brought into the team and to work uh, with the with the existing team. Or alternatively, um, if the capacity is an issue, that also goes to um, point out the importance of um, intensifying the cooperation with other government agencies. Um, this is often problems um, in, in many countries that government agencies tend to work in silo, unfortunately, but, um, and then this interagency cooperation is, is not necessarily a new concept uh, when it comes to anti-corruption or, you know, political finance in general, but this um, threat of digitalization puts an extra pressure uh, on, on existing um, 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 programs. Because um, in many countries, for example, um, some aspects of social media issues uh, are not fall into the responsibility of electoral management, management body. They're often dealt by the uh, Data Protection Commission or, or um, in some cases in, in other uh, agencies. And then um, those agencies, unfortunately, don't necessarily have a very good coordination mechanism. So um, again, um, to deal with this, you know, to, to work with private sector to require more transparency in the spending on online advertisement, for example. Um, political finance oversight agencies uh, need to work much closer with um, other agencies, for example, by setting up a special task force or some sort of the uh, periodic reporting uh, communication mechanisms, uh, or even allowing each other's databases or data sets to be uh, more compatible so that uh, cross checking cross refer referencing will be more um, will be made more easily. But uh, um, those um, issues so speed of innovation and limited information disclosure by the uh, companies and limited oversight capacity, um, weak interagency coordination. They are often the not the they, they're not exhaustive list, but often typically the um, weakest links uh, in in the current uh, legal and regulatory regime when it comes to the um, third party campaigning and certainly when it comes to uh, online campaign finance. So. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I guess in, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm happy to stop here for now, um, but uh, I'm happy to take more questions uh, as we go along. So, um, thank you. Hvala gospodine Hamada i da se odmah izvinim gospodinu Petrovu i da ga zamolim za još malo strpljenja, budući da smo malo odužili sa prethodnim panelom, pa i gospodja Klein, koja ima već preuzete obaveze, zamolila da ustupimo vaš prvo mjesto izlaganja Samo još, budući da su tri izlagača uvezala svoje analizice, samo za još malo strpljenja vas molim. Hvala još jednom. 
Sa nama je dr. Magnus Oman, direktor regionalna kancelarija za Evropu i viši savjetnik za političke financije u Međunarodnoj fondaciji za izborne sisteme IFES. Izvolite, gospodin Oman. Thank you very much and thank you to Mans for uh, inviting me and thank you Goran for your patience. So I will continue the discussion that Lisa and Yuki have initiated on the issue of third parties, though like Lisa I prefer to refer to them as non-contestant campaigner. The term third party is also used to mean a lot of different things so it's very confusing. I'll focus my comments on a few individual European countries to explore uh, both the impact of regulation on non-contestant campaigning and the impact of such campaigning on itself. The first thing we need to realize is the vast majority of European countries do not regulate non-contestant campaigning, though in some cases there are regulations that indirectly impact on these organizations, but not directly. In, in fact, it's only the Czech Republic, Ireland, Latvia and the United Kingdom in Europe that explicitly and directly regulate non-contestant campaigning. There are some regulations, for example, in Belgium and France, there is a ban on election advertising, broadcast media for both contestants and non-contestants, but, but that's pretty much it. <clears throat> of the countries that do regulate this, the, the way they go about it varies quite a bit. We can start with the Czech Republic as an illustration, where regulations on non-contestant campaigning were first introduced through as part of a reform package in 2016. In most countries, this is pretty new. Um, so those wishing to engage in campaigning, even though they're not candidates or parties, have to register. It seems that this has led to an increased transparency in non-contestant campaigning. There are indications that of a declining interest. If we look at the number of entities registered uh, that has halved from the first elections where this was used in 2017, compared to the elections that were held in October uh, this year. Some of these registered entities don't do very much, but, but some are quite active. I found one organization that ran a campaign related to COVID-19, but because they were also criticizing the then government, uh, it is a form of indirect campaigning, even though they were not coordinating with any political party, nor did they directly advocate that people should not vote for that party. They spent over 100,000 euros uh, in that uh, campaign, which is quite a lot of money from a Czech context. I have no idea to what extent their campaign impacted the voting when that party lost the election. There are a couple of countries, especially Slovakia, introduced similar rules in 2016, but then removed them again in 2018, replacing them with a blanket ban on campaigning by anyone who is not a contestant. Um, we have rules that are a little bit like this in places like Romania, and Lisa Klein mentioned this, and I think if such a ban um, is brought to the European Court of Human Rights, they are very likely to find it to be in breach of Article 10 uh, of the European Convention of Human Rights on Free Speech. So that's a very interesting point. There haven't been that particular case, but the Euro European Court has several times indicated that it is acceptable to regulate non-contestant campaigning, but not to ban it. One European country where regulations on non-contestant campaigning has been discussed at quite some length is, is Ireland. And the reason is that the wording in the law there indicates that it could be interpreted to mean that entities engaging independently in election campaigns without favoring or targeting any direct contestant may still be required to register and comply with various rules. And there is a concern that this may hinder the freedom of association and expression. 
and organizations such as Transparency International and the Irish Council for Civil Liberties have raised concerns regarding this issue, even making comparisons to the requirements in some other countries, such as Russia, for certain civil society organizations to register as, as foreign agents. I'll round off with an example of a country where the issue of non-contesting campaigning is not regulated, um, Germany. There is a report by the Atlantic Council from 2018 that indicated that there is a German civil society group called in English Rights and Freedom Club. And they have spent somewhere between 20 and 30 million euros on behalf of a particular, or in favor of, sorry, a particular German political party, Alternative für Deutschland. You may know it's as a right-wing party. It's now the fifth largest in the Bundestag. So these 20, 30 Euro, uh, million euros over three years should be compared to the 16 million that the party itself raised in one of those years in 2016. I should stress these activities are completely legal in Germany, no indication that anyone has broken the law. But since German non-contesting campaigners are not required to reveal their finding sources, we have no information of who has funded a significant part of the campaigning in favor of AFD in recent years. For example, we don't know if this money has come from foreign sources. It is completely legal. There are no bans on non-contesting campaigners receiving and spending foreign funds. But we can compare that to the rules for political parties themselves, where donations over a thousand euros from foreign sources are banned. So that's just highlighting uh, the issue that we are talking about. And I want to round off by an issue that both Elisa and Yuka have touched upon. If we consider regulations on non-contestant campaigning, please remember the administrative burden on whatever institution that is being set or mandated to implement these rules. If you think that the public institution today is not currently effective in overseeing the finances of political parties and candidates, do realize that if you then add the workload to oversee the finances of non-contested campaigners as well, this will require a very significant increase in the capacity of these oversight institutions. I'll end there for now. Thank you. Hvala vam lijepo. Evo, konačno je došao redi gospodina Gorana Petrova, savjetnik za izbore kancelarije OEPS-a za demokratske institucije i ljudska prava ODIR. Još jednom vam se zahvaljujem na strpljenju. Izvolite. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a very interesting discussion that we are participating in. Um, unlike my colleagues, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more in general in terms of um, how ODIR approaches the, the work of um, observation of uh, political parties and campaign financing. But then I'm also tr uh, try to concentrate on some issues which are specifically um, applicable in relation to the Montenegro electoral contest context. Um, just a brief uh, update of what we are doing, or what is doing nowadays in 2021. I just want, wanted to say that we have a uh, we are celebrating 30 years of order this year. And just recently we have, we have held the 400th uh, election observation mission. That one was in Uzbekistan this year. And that uh, even during COVID times, we continue with the observation uh, and assessment of election processes. And we have resumed uh, deploying also short-term observers uh, most recently in uh, uh, Moldova and Armenia this year. And also maybe more applicably for this event, we have published two new handbooks this year. And one is on the observation of the election campaign and political environments. And the other one is guidelines for observation of election campaigns on social networks, something that uh, Yuki was uh, talking a little bit uh, more in detail. And this, uh, uh, maybe it's worth noting that this um, handbook, these guidelines mention basically uh, how, how the participating states nowadays are approaching the challenges of um, 
of conducting, uh, of basically seeing how money is spent uh, during the campaign periods by both contestants and uh, third parties and challenging their facing in um, uh, approaching it, whether they should regulate it or not and how to regulate uh, such spending, whether it should be similar to what has already been regulated with, um, uh, you know, generally in broadcasting or, or, or Shall they actually devise new methods of uh, <laughs> observing how the money is spent, let's say, on social networks? Um, so, audit and, and campaign finance. We have strong attention on campaign finance issues uh, nowadays. We have uh, often dedicated uh, campaign finance analysts. Uh, either that, or we uh, do this as a portfolio with political or more often legal analysts. But we do have dedicated sections uh, in our observation reports which deal with campaign finance. And uh, of course, as you know, we do have a, a campaign finance handbook that was uh, published in 2015, which covers in general terms um, a number of issues such as legal framework, uh, contributions and expenditures, uh, reporting and disclosures, oversight and monitoring importantly, and of course, sanctions and appeals. Um, um, since 2011, we have issued, let's say, a total of almost 3,000 recommendations. And I'm saying this because out of these, 331 were, or more than 10%, were specifically in relation to campaign finance, basically. So about 10% of our recommendations deal with campaign finance issues. And this is, uh, this is about regulation. There are additional recommendations which are in our campaign sections related to misuse of or use of state resources, uh, vote buying, and so on. So there is more, actually. Um, we base our approach on um, OSC commitments, international obligations, standards, and more, uh, and more and more good practice as well. Uh, the benefits of this uh, approach are obvious. We shed light on the domain of uh, uh, spending you know, money in politics, but there are many challenges in our, in our work. Uh, most importantly, we have a, a limited role as observers. We cannot act as... Uh, anti-corruption activists or journalists or, uh, or auditors and such. And another big limitation is duration of our deployment. Uh, a lot of um, uh, um, um, events, practices, which are related with campaign finance and political party financing are happening before and after <laughs> the, the exact election period. So, so we are missing uh, critical aspects. And apart from trying to do our own analysis, we, uh, on, on election observation missions, we rely a lot on uh, an, uh, analysis of um, uh, election stakeholders that are uh, participating in the election process in the country. In terms of um, obligations, binding documents, there are not many of them. One of them would be, um, um, U United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which set out standards for transparency aimed to reduce various types of corruption. It is the only legally binding multilateral uh, international anti-corruption treaty and is particularly uh, relevant for implementation of measures for prevention of abuse of state resources uh, for campaigners. Maybe to single out Article 7 uh, 3 from this um, convention, which says, uh, um, each state party shall uh, consider taking appropriate legislative and administrative measures to enhance transparency in the funding uh, of cand candidatures for elected uh, public office and, where applicable, the funding of political parties. So this is an uh, article specifically talks about uh, raising transparency, enhancing transparency in the funding. Another one would be... Um, um, in the General Comments 25 to the Article 25 of the, of the UN uh, CCPR, ICCPR, there is paragraph 19, which says reasonable limitations on campaign expenditures may be justified where this is necessary to ensure the free choice of voters is not undermined or the democratic process distorted by the disproportionate expenditures on behalf of any candidate or party. So, um, of course, ICCPR is a binding document, and some uh, many people actually say says that uh, as authoritative reading of Article 25, the general comments are also can be considered as binding. So this article can also be considered as binding, and it uh, talks about reasonable limitation on campaign expenditures. 
There are other international documents such as Convention of Elimination of Discrimination Against Women and Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that all provide special measures to encourage more, more balanced participation of these groups. Uh, pre in previous, um, the previous panel was talking a lot about um, increasing participation of women and uh, and um, and it is usual that some level of public campaign financing uh, may contribute to increasing this uh, this goal. Um, apart from that, we have the recommendation 2003-4 of the Council of Europe's uh, Council of Ministers on common rules against corruption in the funding of political parties and electoral campaigns. We have um, in our own um, 1990 OSC Copenhagen document, we don't talk, this is from 1990, we don't talk much about campaign finance at all actually, but we do talk about uh, 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 ensuring that there is uh, not, no blurring between party and state, which do talk about the misuse of um, or proper use of administrative resources so, uh, saying that a clear separation between the state and political parties, uh, in particular, political parties will not be merged with the state. This is very important in certain um, uh, election observation missions that we are conducting. Conducting Other documents include 2002 Venice uh, Commission's Code of Good Practice of, of, in Electoral Matters, and the document that we uh, uh, wrote together with them, which is uh, um, the VC and all the guidelines on political party regulations. Uh, these guidelines in, include uh, our reading uh, of standards and good practices in, in terms of uh, regulation of political party and campaign finances. And it's a very valuable document and we use it more and more in um, our reports, including in the last uh, 2020 Montenegro uh, um, final report. Uh, I've maybe forgot to mention that our um, campaign finance um, handbook uh, contains contains an annex with the uh, more exhaustive reading of all the um, OSC commitments and other international standards which we use in uh, discussing campaign finance issues. In terms of Montenegro campaign finance framework, um, so the new relatively new law from 2019 19 political finance law brings some improvements to overall framework which includes uh, uh, campaign, defining campaign activities uh, uh, under its scope and disallowing some commercial activities by political parties, which was also discussed in the previous uh, panel. But, uh, but there are more negative uh, aspects that we have observed. And this is the one is that the legal framework in general does not establish sufficient safeguards against uh, corruption. And it does not establish uh, uh, and, and does allow for circumvention of campaign finance rules. There, is, there are a number of gaps and uh, conflicting uh, provisions that remain in the legal framework, and they undermine the legal certainty of campaign finance in Montenegro. And there is also noted public, a lack of public trust in the campaign finance regulatory framework in Montenegro. Uh, briefly about the gaps that we identified, the law lacks regulation of the use of loans, the Lolex comprehensive methodology for evaluation of in-kind donations. Um, for example, it allows contestants to calculate the average price of gratuitous uh, services at their own discretion. Uh, and uh, also the um, discounts are not uh, included as part of, as reported as donations. Uh, there are sanctions for defined for early campaigning, but the law does not specifically define what would uh, these uh, activities constitute, uh, activities uh, in, during the early campaigning. And there is uh, absence of sanctions for inaccurate reporting. Um, and I, uh, I we, we are sort of, I guess, running out of time. I wanted to single out uh, three examples how we uh, use um, uh, international standards, but also good practice in uh, treating the findings in our reports and uh, which uh, let, uh, let us build towards the recommendation that we include in our final reports. In the first example, uh, let's briefly talk about the limits of effective oversight. We have a finding that absence of sanctions for inaccurate reporting limits the effectiveness of oversight. And then uh, we basically what we do is we um, reference uh, three pieces of, um, uh, well, to our uh, good practice, one is a standard, 
Uh, one is that irregularities in finan financial reporting should result in the loss of all or part of such funds for the party. Other available sanctions may include the payment of administrative uh, fines by the party. This is taken from paragraph 215 of uh, the guidance on political party regulation, uh, which was produced by Venice Commission and Odir. Uh, equally so, paragraph 2020, uh, 224 sorry, says that sanctions should be applied for political parties found in violation of relative laws. And further on, that the sanctions uh, at all times must be objective, enforceable, effective, and proportionate to their specified purpose. The, the uh, um, uh, phenomenon of, phenomenon of uh, proportionality is uh, very important here that the, um, that the sanctions should actually reflect uh, um, uh, and be uh, proportionate to the purpose of the law. And of course, uh, all the sanctions should be firmly and uh, well grounded in the, in the legislation or, or accompanying regulations. But then that also that the state should require the infringement of rules concerning the funding of political parties and electoral campaigns to be subject to effective, proportionate, and dissuasive sanctions, which is from the Article 16 of the Council of Europe's recommendation 2013, 2003, sorry, that I already mentioned before. Second example would be about the limits of transparency of funding. We have a finding that the contestants can declare any income to their campaign funds as coming from the regular party account without disclosing the origins of such uh, contributions. This was something that was dis uh, discussed at length uh, during the previous panel. Basically, we have a phenomenon that uh, we do have uh, donations that need to be um, disclosed uh, on, in a bi-weekly fashion, in, um, reported, um, and then they are published uh, um, online uh, every two weeks before during the campaign period. But uh, if the party is transferring money from their own uh, account to the campaign funding account, uh, the, it it remains in transparent, opaque. Basically, what what this money is, where this money is coming from, and then only only in the in the um, political party uh, final re uh, yearly reports can it be seen uh, uh, the the origin of of such money and so on. And then we do have a uh, we we do ground it in international uh, good practice that all disclosure uh, reports should be produced on a consolidated basis to include all levels of party activities, which is in paragraph two hundred two of our guidance on political party regulation, and that the nature and value of all donations received by a political party should be identified in financial reports, paragraph two hundred and three. And the last example, I hope we have still time is uh, about the ineffective expenditure ceiling or um, expenditure limit. We have a finding that the expenditure limit, which is 2.3 million euro uh, in Montenegro, remains unreasonably high. Uh, basically, it's so high that it's so almost as in, inexistent. Uh, and it allows for excessive spending with potential undue influence on the will of, uh, on the will of voters. And... Uh, and uh, we also, not to repeat, but um, we also um, uh, ground this uh, as a finding, uh, as, a, as a conclusion as well in, uh, in the uh, guidelines on political party regulations. So we do have three uh, new recommendations uh, in the 2020 report. Uh, two are pertinent uh, for, to this discussion and, and say that the law should be reviewed to address gaps and ambiguities, including regulating the use of loans, developing a comprehensive methodology for evaluation, evaluation of in-kind donations, and defining the activities that constitute pro prohibited early campaigning. And the second one is that to ensure transparency, accountability, and integrity of campaign finance, the law should be amended to prescribe effective, proportionate, and dissuasive sanctions, and to provide for an ex, uh, explicit obligation of the oversight body, which is APC in this case, to identify and publish the information on inaccuracies, including unreported incomes and expenditures. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Zahvaljujem gospodine Petrov i za kraj ovoga panela čućemo gospodina Richarda Pilđera, direktor Osijeka za izborne zločine u Osijeku za javni integritet, stručnjak Ministarstva pravde Sjedinih američkih Uh, 
Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Richard Pilger, and I bring a different perspective. So I'm a prosecutor in the U.S. federal government. Um, what I do all day, every day, is uh, try and put people in prison for violating our campaign finance laws um, and also our ballot fraud laws. Uh, my background is as a corruption prosecutor, which is important for uh, a reason that will become apparent shortly. But uh, I spent my first 20 years with uh, the federal government uh, prosecuting core corruption, meaning bribery, in essence, uh, quid pro quo bribery. So that's what everyone understands. It's in UNCAC. Uh, every, every country has their laws on exchanging things of value with public officials uh, in exchange for official action in a quid pro quo. We're all familiar with this. Why, why does that experience matter? Well, part of why I segued into uh, election crimes and campaign finance in particular um, has to do with the uh, root of all American regulation of campaign finance. So the Supreme Court in the United States um, has recognized the principle that my colleagues have addressed of uh, free speech and allowing association, avoiding a human rights violation, as uh, the European court would uh, understand it or call it. Um, and they have said that all campaign finance regulation must be rooted in fighting quid pro quo corruption or the appearance of quid pro quo corruption. So with campaign finance, we're obviously all concerned here with the issue of transparency. And when you have transparency and you can see what money is being spent to the benefit of a politician, you can examine further whether that might uh, implicate a quid pro quo understanding between the contributor and the politician or the candidate. Now, the Lisa uh, correctly focused on the difficult issue of expenditures. Um, it's easy to understand regulation of contributions and the amounts of contributions, especially if they go directly to a candidate. We understand contributions as uh, anything that uh, would influence uh, a federal election. Um, we recognize the rights of independent groups uh, to spend in vastly greater amounts of money to influence a federal uh, election. Um, on the expenditure side, um, there is a concern uh, that it is less likely to result in the appearance of quid pro quo corruption, especially with the independent groups, uh, because if they're truly independent and they're not uh, working with campaigns, working with candidates or incumbents, uh, it's a little more difficult to make the connection between that activity and the idea of a quid pro quo with the candidate or public official. Um, this is an ongoing and very complicated issue that uh, could potentially result in a uh, drastic uh, revision by the Supreme Court of the United States of our entire campaign finance uh, reporting system. Now, um, in international conferences, I'm always very leery of saying that the United States is the model or has uh, the best system. And I, and I don't mean to say that now, but I am going to say we have a very highly developed system in campaign finance, as opposed to some areas of the other areas of the law of corruption um, that I do commend to this group. Uh, and I distributed in advance uh, a link that the hosts may be able to, or hopefully have given everyone uh, to our monograph on, on US uh, election crime law, which includes an extensive chapter on campaign finance. You can read all about the technicalities of it there, and I won't dive too deeply into those. I do want to, um, I'm, I'm sorry Lisa had to leave because uh, I want to take issue a little bit with her definition of, of who we regulate. It's We don't simply regulate the independent groups, and I'm focusing on them now, who um, expressly advocate with magic words 
for or against the election of a particular candidate. We, we regulate those who in, try to influence federal elections in, in, in our federal law of campaign finance. So this can include what we call the functional advo- the functional equivalent of saying vote for someone or against someone. So to take a couple of examples to make this concrete, uh, if you had an independent group in the U.S. Uh, that launched what we call an issue campaign uh, supporting the idea of build a wall between the United States and Mexico, well, obviously that's associated with a certain former president and a certain political party that advocated that issue. That would be the functional equivalent of saying elect that candidate, support that party. Um, and so we do regulate that. Um, the uh, On the other side, uh, we have a uh, president now who has a slogan, Build Back Better. And if you had an issue campaign of Build Back Better using uh, language supporting the expenditures on, on public infrastructure associated with that, everyone would understand that that's a, that's a can- political ad campaign uh, designed to support a particular candidate. So we're not rigidly tied to magic words. Um, the problem with um, independent expenditure groups, as I've experienced it prosecuting people, um, is the coordination issue. Um, Coordination is uh, something that is very difficult to find. And when the Supreme Court uh, allowed the unlimited spending by independent groups, uh, which they did in 2010, uh, people suspected we wouldn't be able to detect it. Well, we have we have ways of detecting it. We, we can develop people uh, who come in and complain for whatever reason. They may be disgruntled with their employers or whatever, and they say, well, the candidate was on a golf cart with a billionaire discussing ad campaigns. Well, we can make those cases, and we do. We have. We've put people in prison for this kind of coordination, um, and we we actively seek it out, and we find it, and we prosecute it. The, um, the, the topic that my colleagues have developed is how can you see this, and how can the regulators uh, provide transparency to it? And there was a particular issue raised about the resources required for that. I will say that uh, I will say a, a good thing for the United States. Uh, I'm often addressing our problems, but in the in the United States, we have an agency, the Federal Election Commission. It's not a criminal agency; it's a civil administrative agency, which handles the transparency. Um, and we really don't have a problem if people comply with their reporting requirements. It's highly automated. It's linked to the Internet. Uh, it, de- it depends on reports from the candidate committees, the uh, political parties, and the independent expenditure groups. So if an independent expenditure group exists and it's going to take in or spend $1,000 or more, um, on influencing a federal race, they must register with the FEC and they must make reports of their donors and their expenditures. Uh, this ties back to the idea of providing a window onto the possible uh, quid pro quo corruption or the appearance of quid pro quo corruption between such groups and the people that they are benefiting. The um, the FEC really has no problem doing this. I mean, and if people don't comply, that's independently a violation of our civil law, our, federal, our administrative law, and our criminal law. If we can show willfulness, meaning that, that people knew they should do this registration and reporting and they didn't do it. And we prosecute people for that. Um, and the FEC itself has investigative abilities uh, to look into uh, people who haven't registered when they should and uh, to fine them uh, to, to, to impose financial penalties on those who haven't registered and reported, um, but perhaps uh, were not acting with criminal intent, elevated criminal intent uh, required in this context because it's a it's a highly regulatory scheme. It's not something everyone would necessarily understand as a crime. Um, so we have an extensive and effective uh, transparency regime in the Federal Election Commission, and then we have the Department of Justice working uh, alongside the Federal Election Commission separately with an independent mission, but 
enforcing the very same campaign finance laws uh, with criminal remedies. Um, anything that's a violation of uh, the Federal Election Commission's transparency rules as to candidates, parties, independent expenditure groups, anything that the FEC can find, I can also charge criminally if I, if I can show uh, a threshold amount of money at issue um, and criminal intent. The, um, a, a couple of concerns that we have that, are, that will be troublesome everywhere are um, protecting uh, minority groups who are subject to harassment, for example. So uh, in the United States, uh, the people are not generally sympathetic to the Communist Party dating back to the Cold War. Um, I'm not going to address the politics of that or the uh, anything about the Communist Party. It's just that in the United States, they're not popular and they're subject to threats and intimidation and so on. Similarly, um, uh, during the civil rights era of United States history in the 1950s and 60s, uh, when African Americans were attempting uh, to establish their rights, uh, especially their right to vote, um, they were oppressed by local state governments um, and subject to threats and intimidation. Um, and they, uh, they have uh, also been recognized in federal law as deserving protection where they should not have to re reveal their donors. So the communists, the civil rights groups, others who are subject to interference by uh, popular um, dislike and mischief can be exempted from reporting their donors to protect their donors. Um, and this is a complicated issue. Um, it's, it, it's not applied frequently, but we, uh, we have the flexibility to address that concern and to protect the rights of, of donors who would be subject to persecution. Um, but basically everyone who contributes, uh, that is, uh, spends money to influence a federal campaign has to report it and it gets on the internet within a couple of days. And if there are discrepancies or people report that there's inaccuracies and that can be through the media or through informants who come to law enforcement or the FEC and make a complaint, it can be through political opponents. There are robust mechanisms to delve into it, to find coordination, uh, to ensure that people correct inaccuracies in their reporting or register if they have not registered. Um, this does cost money. It costs money to have a federal election commission, but it's not in any way overwhelming. Um, I've never heard anyone complain about the federal election commission's budget being a particular problem uh, for the United States. Um, they, they have a substantial staff, but it's not overwhelming. Um, and I think I, 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 I'm happy to say America handles that uh, particular regulatory um, enforcement regime fairly well. The, the entire set of laws uh, that they enforce is in this, uh, uh, try and get it on camera, this little book, it's not very thick. Um, and that's, um, it's not rocket science. Uh, and the campaigns all understand this. There's an election bar that advises them that, with lawyers who understand these rules and keep them on track. It's not particularly onerous or burdensome um, in, in, in my view. Um, and I've persuaded many courts that it's not that complicated or onerous or burdensome. And I've persuaded many juries that it's not complicated or onerous or burdensome. And because there's a consensus on that in the United States, we're able to enforce these laws with fines by the FEC and with prison terms uh, where appropriate for criminal conduct. Um, one, of, one of my colleagues, um, I'm sorry, I forget who, I think it was Goran, mentioned the uh, problem with enforcement against inaccurate reporting. Um, we have developed um, a very effective use of general criminal law on false reports to the government uh, to punish that kind of conduct uh, very severely. Um, it, we can charge it as a, a simple false statement to the government, which is a routine law I'm sure all the countries, including Montenegro, have in some form. Uh, we've also applied obstruction of justice law to it. Um, 
when it reaches a certain level of uh, complexity in the in the scheme to uh, deprive the FEC of, of accurate information for public uh, reporting through the internet. Um, I, th I think given the shortness of time that that may be all I should say. Um, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions uh, that the that the colleagues in Montenegro may have. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Hvala najljepšem učinu na izlaganjima, na jednoj drugačijoj perspektivi, na sugestijama. Jel ima eventualno nekih pitanja? Zvolite. Uh, hello, I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know which language I should speak, whether you can hear. Okay, English. Okay, great. Uh, well, once again, thank you very much for coming, uh, or actually for, for virtually coming to our conference and speaking. Uh, we will do our best uh, for the politicians to listen to your messages and listen to the recommendations you gave. My question would be, my main question, even though I have quite quite many and I could spend days asking you questions, but my main question is uh, how to regulate issues related to online funding, including by third parties. Online funding in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, crowdsourcing, but also in terms of uh, something that Yuki mentioned uh, at the beginning of his speech in terms of uh, funding uh, the campaigns, the promotional marketing campaigns uh, using social networks. Is there any kind of global um, um, attempt to regulate the, uh, the social networks, in particular Facebook, in terms of increasing transparency? And what, because we can hardly do anything from a tiny country like Montenegro, but certainly bigger countries already achieved much uh, higher transparency than we have it in the Balkans. For example, in Slovakia, not to mention in the US, you can get much more information about who paid for the ads for political parties. Uh, is there any kind of international net, uh, effort to regulate these issues? And what would be your recommendation for us, having in mind extremely limited capacities of our administration, including the institution responsible for enforcing the law? Thank you very much. Hi, I, I guess <laughs> I may just give it a step first and then I'll also invite uh, other colleagues to uh, jump in if I may. Um, well, thanks very much for the, uh, the question, especially in relation to the regulation of the um, uh, social media spending, let's say, and as well as crowdfunding. Um, <laughs> we do observe as international organizations uh, all the um, political campaign finance laws across the world, but this I can say for sure that no country's system is perfect. And then on this particular issue, um, every country that we speak to are currently are really struggling to address this. But one good, potentially good practice that I could um, mention here today is the is the case of Latvia. Um, in, in, in Latvia, the political finance is regulated by the anti-corruption agency it's not the electoral management body. So the, the agency has a relatively more strong mandate uh, when it comes to um, uh, requiring information from the campaigners or political parties, or they could even uh, have a legal mandate to uh, sanction any uh, mis uh, misconduct, for example. And in this case, they also um, made man mandatory to request uh, the social media platforms to um, provide price lists that they they charge uh, for, for their services prior to the campaigns. And uh, that could potentially be a very good, uh, good practice for Montenegro and other countries. So that makes it very easier to verify um, afterwards so that, um, um, so, so that they also can compare the uh, spending by the political parties and vis-a-vis -vis this the price list uh, submitted to, to the uh, oversight agency so that they could tell. Um, whether their spending on deported spending on the social media campaigns is actually corresponds to this uh, private pr price list. 
and then if there's a huge um, uh, gap that that tells a story that either uh, uh, a social media can campaign um, companies give them a very unfair discount or uh, political parties are actually uh, being supported or um, using social media through other means, for example. And, and then also, um, as, as, as this is not an easy uh, thing to do, but the corporation, securing corporation from the uh, private uh, company is really the key. Um, if I understand correctly, I think in case of Latvia, I think that there's a very high level pressure. I think even some minister level officials uh, visited US and Silicon Valley and then had a talk uh, with these social media companies and requesting um, the full disclosure of the information for in relation to the election campaigns in Latvia, for example. So uh, there's a very strong political will in the country in itself to deal with this. And then uh, and they, they request the social media company to work with them. So this type of the uh, political will drive is also uh, very important. And then also um, active civil uh, society organization group. I mean, uh, that's also another key. Um, they are often the ones that are able to um, well, monitor or try to scrutinize how much uh, Facebook ads or, or Twitter uh, paid um, or other form of paid social media as there are in the, in the online sphere um, and report back to uh, oversight agencies, for example. So uh, the active civil society monitoring or media monitoring, putting a pressure on the uh, entire issue. I mean, that's another layer of very, very important um, uh, oversight, I would say. But uh, yeah, Magnus or Goran, Richard, I mean, um, I'll, I'm, I'm sure you also have some insights on that. Well, I'm very happy to, to jump in there quickly. And thank you, Yuki, and thank you for the question. And you raised the issue of emphasis at the international level. Well, so we don't have an international court. We don't actually have a structure through which uh, international companies, which of course the social media giants are, that could force them to declare this information. So the, the, the main efforts is, to some extent what Yuki said in having governments or at a very high level requesting information from, um, from the social media giants. It's not easy. There have been a number of failures where institutions, individual oversight institutions have attempted, they've written to uh, various social media giants they have not had a response. Um, there are international corporations, uh, like IFAS, for example, supports a network of EMB election management bodies that are working together in their response for a joint uh, engagement with the social media giants. Uh, but I think that doing that on, on a together rather than a nation to nation level is more likely to have an impact. But I also really want to stress the issue that Yuki ended with, which is the, so the civil society angle of this. Many of the state enforcement um, initiatives, the type of powers that exist that Richard was talking about in the United States, don't necessarily exist in countries in the Balkans. Uh, and the, the importance of social media to be able to show what type of campaigning that is going on is incredibly important in terms of uh, reforming, pushing for reform, part of legislation, but let's not forget also of the behavior of political actors. There's also the angle that we may not necessarily want state institutions to have massive amounts of powers in certain situations if we are not entirely convinced that that will be used with um, respect to all political actors today and in the next decade. So there are many issues that we need to bear in mind. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Mr. P Mr. Pilger. If uh, he could share some uh, experience and some examples about uh, dealing with uh, illegal financing of the campaigns when it comes to international col collaboration and how the USA and, uh, and the actors from USA uh, do that kind of work. Thanks. Um, so our law is uh, very clear on contributions from abroad. Um, 
they are prohibited not just at the federal level, but all federal, state, local, city uh, elections um, are subject to this law that, that, that no foreign contributions are allowed. Now, the immediate uh, design of the law is to prohibit contributions uh, that go to candidates. Um, there is some debate on whether this applies to uh, independent expenditures. There's, uh, there was a famous incident where the president of the United States, President Obama, uh, criticized the Supreme Court's ruling allowing unlimited third party or independent expenditures, saying that would allow uh, uh, concealed foreign interference in our elections and one of the Supreme Court justices in the chamber at this speech yelled out that they don't know that was not true. Um, the Department of Justice takes the position that these uh, contributions from abroad are prohibited, that if they are meant to influence a federal election, uh, they are contrary to our law. Uh, the independent counsel, Mr. Mueller, who investigated the former president, uh, brought indictments against certain Russians uh, for having uh, done this, uh, among other things, in the 2016 election. Um, but there is also a, a view among scholars, uh, among others outside the Department of Justice, that we should not be afraid of messaging from abroad as long as it's labeled as such. So uh, everyone agrees that concealed foreign influence in American elections, foreign spending uh, through purchases of uh, social media advertisements or purchasing of, of broadcast or print uh, advertisements um, are illegal if they are not attributed. So we have in the United States uh, the RT television network, which is sponsored by the Russian government. Um, and they, they are permitted, tolerated, and allowed to uh, speak to the American people. But they have to, uh, at the head of every broadcast, they have to say, we are sponsored by the Russian government. And the view is, uh, if you have that transparency, if the listeners are advised that the message is coming from abroad, that this is consistent with our First Amendment values, that people have a right to uh, hear that message if they want to tune into RT, and we trust to the public discourse of the campaign uh, for people, for candidates uh, to to address the message that's coming through from a foreign government that reveals itself and its uh, source of the being the source of the the news, opinion, propaganda, whatever you want to call it. Um, if they don't reveal their influence, if they do it secretly, uh, we can uh, pursue them under our uh, Foreign Agents Registration Act. Uh, law, which says if you're acting on behalf of a foreign government in the United States, you have to say that that's what you're doing. You can do it as long as you register and say that you're doing it. Um, so now, I, I acknowledge this This is a power of uh, regulation that can be abused. So we have many, um, w what the Department of Justice considers good faith and important civil society efforts with which we cooperate in foreign governments, uh, I'm sorry, in foreign countries um, to encourage discourse promoting democracy. And when you have an association between the United States and an NGO in Montenegro or anywhere else, um, it's possible that it could be stifled. And this, this has happened in uh, countries, and uh, I'm sure you're all aware of this, and I, I won't belabor it, but Russia in particular um, will, will persecute these organizations, uh, even if they reveal their association openly, their association with the United States or foreign funding. So um, it's, it's a complicated issue. Um, in the United States, we're still working through uh, how concerned we should be with uh, messages from abroad. 
um, and I'm, I'm speaking solely of information messaging. I'm not talking about interference with polling places and other kinds of uh, borderline espionage activity. That's a totally different topic. But in terms of information, let me conclude by saying uh, the U.S. Uh, doesn't want to play whack-a-mole with every foreigner who expresses a political opinion that gets heard in the United States. It's kind of a fool's errand. Um, where we do need to take action uh, against efforts at scale by countries like Russia or Iran or other places that have been publicly identified by our intelligence community as uh, trying to influence American elections secretly. Um, the department's position, my position, is uh, that we can and should go after that and prosecute it, uh, but always bearing in mind that the there are limits yet to be defined here on what's a good idea. In doing this with social media companies, I want to echo and amplify um, Yuki's message that um, we we depend on uh, relationships with the social media companies and uh, and not on laws requiring the social media companies necessarily to proactively do things. Um, but on a relationship where they will expeditiously process our um, government efforts to investigate uh, spending, especially foreign spending. Um, this is complicated by the fact that we're also often suing them for antitrust violations and other problems, and, we, and they are very concerned about the privacy of their users, um, which makes it a fraught relationship. But um, I would say there's a consensus between the U.S. government and the social media platforms that pursuing uh, foreign advocacy in the United States, hidden foreign advocacy, is something we should all be working on together, and that relationship goes well. So I hope that helps answer the question. Sa ovim zaključujemo i ovaj panel i 